Today, we're looking at the double pendulum in Python. This is a classic physics problem that you deal with at least at one point in your undergrad degree. But it's usually a pain and it usually requires a lot of writing down on paper and not particularly fun stuff. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to do it in Python. No pencil or paper required. All the symbolic work will be done on the computer. And then the systems of equations, which you can't solve by hand, we'll solve them on the computer as well. Finally, once we're done that, we'll make an animation of the double pendulum, a very simple one, so you can actually see what's going on with the chaotic motion of this system. Please be sure to subscribe if you like this video, only about half of you are subscribed. Join the Discord server as well, there's a link in the description to that, and enjoy. Okay, so as I mentioned, this video is going to be split into three parts. We're first going to set up the system of equations symbolically on a computer so we don't have to use a pencil and do that by hand. This is really easy to do using SymPy. Uh, once we have those equations, then we can solve them numerically on a computer. So that's the second part. And then the third part is actually animating the solution. So here I have the picture of the double pendulum. There are going to be two angles, theta 1 and theta 2. These are the quantities that depend on time. The state of the double pendulum can be entirely known just if you know theta one and theta two, and then you can get any configuration by changing these. So these are the two free parameters of the system. Then there's L1 and L2, these are fixed uh, throughout the problem, and then there's M1 and M2, the two masses as well. And so what we wanna do is we wanna define all these symbols symbolically in SymPy so that we can eventually get Lagrange's equations of motion. So I define all the symbols like this. I use uh, simp.symbols. I just split them up into uh, three different things here. So I have T and G for time and gravity. That's just T and G. And of course I use simp.symbols. Same for M1 and M2 and same for L1 and L2 corresponding to everything in this problem. So I can define these here and I can do operations on them. I can take T for example, and uh, I can take the square of T. So T squared, I can take uh, simp.sign of T squared and you know do all these operations on these symbols so uh, this sort of math in SymPy is uh, very straightforward um, but I need to define theta 1 and theta 2 and now throughout this problem these are going to be functions of time so what I want to do is I want to define them a little bit differently so I have theta 1 and theta 2 these are SymPy symbols and uh, I write them as theta 1 and theta 2 but when I define them using this I make sure to say it's a SymPy dot function so it knows that theta 1 and theta 2 are actually a function of some other thing so if I go like this and then I look at theta one, um, it, it's not quite written like the other symbols. So what I need to then do is explicitly write them as functions of time, because that's what they are in this problem. They're gonna be functions of time. So I have theta one and theta two like this, and uh, I can look at them. And now there's theta one, which is a function of time here. Uh, the next thing I want to do, of course, because the derivatives of theta 1 show up and the second derivatives of theta 1 and theta 2 also show up in Lagrange's equations, is I want to define them explicitly starting here. So theta 1 uh, underscore d means first derivative, um, same thing with theta 2, and underscore dd means second derivative. So to take the derivative of something like a function like this, theta 1, which is a function of time in uh, SymPy, is I go simp.diff and I say I want to differentiate theta 1 with respect to time. And it knows that theta 1 is a function of time. So it will do this uh, correspondingly. So if I look at theta one uh, D, for example, uh, it'll write it like this. So it keeps everything kind of abstract and same with DD, it'll show the second derivative like this. So I'm just sort of getting all the symbols ready uh, for later on. Uh, then I define X one and Y one. That's the position of the first uh, pendulum and X two and Y two, which is the position of the second one. And I define these in terms of the parameters above. So if you look at this diagram here, you can find out what uh, x1 and x2 are just by theta1 and theta2 and a little bit of trigonometry. So uh, x1 is, uh, uh, there should be no negative sign here. x1 is L1 times sine theta1. Um, x2 is L1 times sine theta1 plus L2 times sine theta2. Uh, that's just looking here because this distance is of course sine theta1, uh, L1 here and adding them together to get the first and second. Uh, same thing with the y position, minus L1 cos theta 1 and minus L1 cos theta 1 minus L2 cos theta 2 for x and y. So then I can look at x and y. So x1, for example, it's written like this. Uh, x2 is written like this. So I have all my expressions for the uh, Cartesian coordinates expressed like this. And you might think, well, why do we want the Cartesian coordinates if everything can be expressed in terms of theta 1 and theta 2? Well, those are useful to define the kinetic and potential energy. And the kinetic and the potential energy can be used to obtain the Lagrangian, 
which can then be used to obtain Lagrange's equations of motion, which can then be used to obtain the differential equations. So we're slowly building things up, as you can see. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll define the kinetic the potential energy. So uh, the kinetic energy of the first map mass is uh, one half times m1 times the velocity squared. So this is the derivative of x1 with respect to time squared uh, plus the derivative of y1 with respect to time squared. And then the kinetic energy of the second one is one half m2. Uh, same thing in here. So um, if I run the cell and I just look at t1, for example, it's 0 0.5 m and then it takes the derivative of x1, which of course is uh, this expression here with respect to time. It uses the chain rule on theta, which is nice. You see that everything's sort of accumulating here. And uh, the same thing for T2, which is a little bit longer, of course, because you have these other terms here as well. Uh, then for the potential energy, it's just M1GY1, right? It's the height of the bobs uh, in a certain gravitational field. And uh, V2 is M2 times G times Y2 here. And uh, the total potential energy is just the sum of the two. And you'll note that these are always negative if the bob is hanging down because of the minus L1 and the minus uh, this here. So everything is uh, hanging down there. Uh, and I can look at my Lagrangian and I get this big expression here. And so once you have the Lagrangian for a system, you can find this uh, Lagrange's equations of motion. And Lagrange's equations for this system, of course, we have two parameters, theta one and theta two. And so our equations look like this, uh, dl d theta one minus ddt uh, dl d theta one dot equals zero. Same thing for theta two. So since I have L in SymPy, I can take these derivatives um, explicitly and it's very simple. So dl d theta one here is just sim dot diff. I differentiate L with respect to theta one. That's a parameter I have. Uh, then this expression here, dl d theta one dot, well, that's located in here. dl d theta one dot, just what I have highlighted here. And then outside, there's another derivative with respect to time. So then I differentiate this whole thing with respect to time. And uh, then I simplify it at the end just to make sure that, um, you know, you group like terms and everything like that. And I, you note that there's no equals zero here. I'm just finding everything on the left-hand side for both expressions. And that will give me the two Lagrange's equations. And I can look at them. And I get, this is my first Lagrange's equation of motion. And now since this is equal to zero, what this means is that everything here is equal to zero. The same thing with Lagrange's second equation. And now something important to note here, and that's important for the next step here, is you'll note that the uh, first derivative is squared. You'll see it squared sometimes. There's weird functions of theta one and theta two. But if you just look at the two second derivatives, which is d squared um, dt squared of theta two and d squared dt squared of theta one, they only ever show up as linear factors. So in terms of the second derivatives only and ignoring everything else, I have a system of linear equations with regards to the second derivatives. I have two equations and I have two second derivatives, d squared dt squared of theta one, d squared dt squared of theta two. And if I wanna set up a second order ODE, I wanna solve for the second derivative of each of these. So I have two equations, linear, two unknowns, the second derivatives, and I can solve these. And I do this using simp.solve. So I solve my two Lagrange's equations, and I wanna solve explicitly for uh, the second derivative of theta one, the dd for second derivative, and the second derivative of theta two. So I have these two linear equations, it will rearrange everything and it will solve explicitly for the second derivatives. And so I can do this. And now, for example, if I want, what is d squared dt squared of theta one equal to? What is the second derivative of theta one equal to? I can index it like this. So I just say, I put in the symbol here and it says that the second derivative of theta one with respect to time is equal to this big long expression here. This is a second order ODE. It's a complicated second order ODE but we still have it nonetheless. And uh, the same thing for uh, theta two, uh, another big long expression here. And so since I have these two second order ODEs, we can go ahead to solve them numerically. So in summary, what we have is d squared d theta one dt squared is equal to something, those big long expressions, same thing with d squared d uh, theta two d squared t squared is equal to some big long expression. So these are two second order ODEs. But in Python, we can only solve systems of first order ODEs. So we have second order. So we have a little bit of a problem, but there's a good thing here. And that's that second order ODEs can be converted into first order ODEs. In fact, any second order ODE can be converted to two first order ODEs. And uh, it's done as follows. It's a little trick. You say, well, I'm gonna define a new symbol. I'm gonna call it Z1, it's equal to d theta one dt and uh, Z2 is d theta two dt then by definition dz1 dt is equal to the second derivative, so this thing here, 
and dzt dz2 dt is equal to this here and that just follows from taking the derivative of both sides here so you might think well what's going on here how does that give us first order odes well you have these new symbols here we go from two second order to four first order and for that i get dz dz1 dt which is equal to this here is equal to that big long expression and then by definition d theta 1 dt is equal to z1 so this is a really simple ode um, but it just involves uh, defining a new symbol so think about that a little bit it's a trick it's really useful for these sorts of things and same thing with uh, dz2 and theta2 so really what z1 is is the angular uh, velocity of the bob theta1 is the angle uh, z1 is the angular velocity so that's really what these symbols um, physically represent here um, so we have these four first order ODEs, but we want to convert them to sim um, we want to convert the symbolic expressions, right? Which I have here. This is uh, a symbolic expression. This is symbolic. I want to convert that into a numerical Python function. I want to be able to give it L1, L2, M2, and all these symbols and it to return a number. And that's what I do here using sympy.lambdafy. So I convert a symbolic expression into a numerical function. So I say dz dz1 dt underscore f this is useful for the video underscore f means it's a numerical function it's something that you give a bunch of numbers and it spits out a number so i use sympy.lambdafy um, the arguments are a tuple comes first these are all the arguments you need to give so that big long expression up here well it depends on t it depends on g it dep depends on the two masses uh the two lengths actually it doesn't explicitly depend on t but you can give it this argument anyways it doesn't matter uh, it's useful for odes that do depend on t um, and L1 and L2, and then of course theta1 and theta2, and the derivative of theta1 and the derivative of theta2. So these are all the arguments, and the symbolic expression is this here, which of course I've shown above. If I look at the symbolic expression again, I've done this many times, it's this big long expression. So lambda phi will turn it into something I can give a bunch of numbers and get a number. Uh, same thing for dz2 dt, and then uh, d theta1 dt, which is just this here, well, it takes in theta1 dot, and it returns theta one dot. So it's just a identity function, essentially. This, this is a very um, simple uh, thing here. So it takes in one symbol and it returns exactly that. And so then I can look at um, plug in numbers and see what it returns. So for example, this is at time is two seconds, gravity is 9.81, uh, you know, L1 and L2 are one, theta one and theta two are one, um, uh, the masses are one, the lengths are one, and then some random values for these here. And you'll see that it's really a function that takes in numbers and it spits out a number. And then we can use this with a um, solver in Python to solve the differential equation. So now we have these numerical functions that return the values of these derivatives. Uh, the next step, and this is common whenever you solve ODEs in Python, is we define a vector s. And s contains all the things we want to solve for. And you'll note that z1, theta1, z2, theta2. It contains theta1, z1, theta2, and z2. So this is our vector. Just think of it as the vector s. I call it s in all the videos. Uh, if we're going to use an ODE solver in Python, what we need to do, what all these ODE solvers take in, is a function. And so we need to write a function that takes in s and t. So it takes in this vector. It takes in time t. This is for differential equations that depend on t. In this case, it just so happens not to depend on t, but you have to write it as if it does depend on t. So it takes in s and t and it returns ds dt. So what we're writing is a function ds dt, right? That depends on s and t. So this is weird notation, but this is the derivative, which is the function of s and t. And any system of ODEs can be written like this. That's what this is here. You can think of this as like a vector and everything here depends on s, which is these four parameters here. So our system of ODEs can be fully specified using ds dt. ds dt is like the vector of these four things here. And it depends only on s and t this is a useful way to think about systems of differential equations so our function ds dt it takes an s and t like i said you can also let it in take it in uh, other arguments as well so it takes in gravity uh, the two masses and the two lengths and you just have to specify that when you solve the ode so i first of all i extract the four things from s so s is written like this so uh, this comes from the vector s so it needs to return ds dt so the first thing it needs to return of course is d theta 1 dt so that's the numerical function d theta one dt and of course it takes in just z1 that's this function here uh, the second thing it needs to return is dz1 dt of course you're returning ds dt like i said 
So it takes in this numerical function here, all the arguments it needs, uh, plugging in the two masses, the thetas and the zeds. Same thing with uh, theta two and z two, all in the order of the s that you see here. Uh, so I have my function here. Now that I have this function, I can solve the system of ODEs using an ODE solver in Python. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solve it between zero and 40 seconds at 1,001 different time points. Uh, Gravity is 9.81. Uh, the first mass is two kilograms. The second is one kilogram and uh, the two lengths. So I'm using different masses and different lengths, right? They're not the same. So one of the pendulum arms is longer than the other. To solve it, it's really simple now. It's a one liner. I use ODE int, which is the scipy function. It takes in DSDT, which is this uh, function I defined above. Uh, these are the initial conditions of the ODE. So what I'm saying is that uh, theta one is equal to one radian. Uh, Z1, which is d theta 1 dt, or the angular um, uh, velocity of this uh, pendulum is uh, minus 3 radians per second. Same thing for uh, Z2 and th or theta 2 and Z2 here. Uh, it takes in t as t, so it knows to solve over this times here. And additional arguments to this function, which of course are here, I, there's five other ones as well. It needs to know, okay, well, I also have to give it g, m1, m2, l1, and l2, which I define here. So then I can solve the uh, uh, system and it solves pretty quickly and what's useful for animating later on and keep this in mind is that there are 25 numerical points per second so if I look at t here it goes 0 0 0.04 0 0.08 right if I go um, t where t is less than 1 so these are the how many points here between 0 and 1 second there's 25 of them and that's just by taking the length so every second there's 25 points so if I want to make an animation in real time, I have to go at 25 frames per second to match the, the how many numerical points there are in one second. If I went at 50 frames per second, it would go through all 25 of these frames in half a second. So it'd be going at double time, right? So this is really useful. And especially when you first start making animations in Python, maybe it goes too fast or too slow. You have to make sure you know the time spacing that you're dealing with. So we can obtain theta one and theta two from the answer. That's this little answer here. Uh, so if I look at the answer, uh, it gives a raise like this and it gives uh, four points. So this is uh, theta one, d theta one dt, uh, theta two and d theta two dt. And it gives it as an array like this. So it's four points, then at the next time, four points, then the next time, four points, because there's four different quantities. If I want to extract them easily, I can transpose this array. Then I have one array for theta one, uh, one array for d theta one dt. Same thing with theta two and d theta two dt. And so with answer.t, this is the transposed array. I can obtain theta one and theta two. Uh, theta one is just zero, right? That's the order it is in x, or sorry, s, theta one. And uh, theta two is uh, two, right? It comes zero, one, two, then I get theta two. So I can plot uh, theta one and theta two here, like this. And you see that really what's actually showing up here is uh, I'm just plotting theta two is that it goes like this, then it starts to loop around. And so it maybe winds a lot and gets to this negative value. And you get this sort of pattern here with uh, theta two. Uh, pretty interesting. Remember if it goes past uh, two pi radians, it just means it's going over and over and over and over again. And so you get this sort of chaotic behavior. Okay, so now that we have theta one and theta two as a function of time, we want a function that takes this in and returns x one and x two. So we can actually plot these points and make an animation of the double pendulum. So there's this function get x1, uh, y1, x2, y2. It takes in t, it takes in theta one and theta two, which of course are the only two parameters I need to specify the current state of the um, uh, pendulum. And uh, it takes in L1 and L2, which are the lengths as well. And it basically just returns these equations that I defined above only numerically now I'm using numpy. So L1 times np sine theta one uh, for uh, the first bob, same thing with the y position. Then this is the x position of the second one and the y position of the second one. So it takes in these as an array and it will return arrays of x1, y1, x2, and y2. And I can look at x1 and it's just a time series of points. So if I plot these two points over time and connect them with lines, I get an animation of the double pendulum. And that's what I do here. So uh, my animate function, of course, whenever you're making an animation in Python, you first have to start with an animate function. The animate function takes in the frame of the animation. So of course an animation is just a sequence of frames. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna set the data on a plot. So it'll have three points here. It'll be zero, which is the origin. 
the X location of the uh, pendulum, first pendulum bob, the X location of the uh, second pendulum bob, and uh, same thing with the Y positions as well. So that specifies three points here. Uh, this and this is the origin, this and this as the first bob, and this and this is the second bob. And this is written in such a way that it will plot those three points. So these three points will move around. And I'll connect those points together so it actually have pendulum arms in the middle. So I have my animate function, then I set up a, a standard matplotlib axis. So fig axis uh, plot dot subplots uh, one by one. This is the figure size. I set the face color to be black. Um, I have no X ticks or Y ticks. Of course, I just want a blank sort of canvas here. I start by saying, well, there's no um, plot line here. And as a matter of fact, I don't even need these two extra lines here. So just one line that starts as empty. And then I use my animate function. So any is equal to animation dot funk animation takes in the figure that I've defined here. Uh, it takes in my animate function, which I've defined here. I want to do it for a thousand frames and interval. You usually set to around 50. It's not super important here. So there's going to be a thousand frames. So it will go through all. Remember that there's a thousand and one um, times here. So it will go through all 1000 of those times and plot. And now, like I said before, there are 25 numerical points in one second. That just can be looked at by T here. And if I go T like I did before in the video where T is less than one, there are 25 numerical points here. So if I want to show it in real time, I have to plot at 25 frames per second. So I create my animation like this and then I actually save it to a GIF. And when I do this, I do it at uh, 25 uh, frames per second. And so I can run this and it will actually save my animation. And you can see the animation here. This is the double pendulum. And so as you can see, it's sort of moving around, it's doing its thing. And there it starts to get that sort of chaotic behavior here. And so it's very easy to do all three steps here. We set up all the math, no pencil required. Um, we then solve the systems of equations numerically on a computer, and we can make a pretty basic animation like this. And of course, if you want to sort of go off on your own and do more impressive stuff, you can do more impressive animation, but what I'm really here is at the physics of the problem. And so all the physics and all the animation and stuff at a basic level can be done like this. And so this is the double pendulum done super quickly in Python. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to like and subscribe. I have plenty of other videos, much more complicated double pendulum videos. So check those out as well. Check out my spinning top video. This is like a a much more difficult application of the same sort of thing that we did here of solving Lagrange's equations uh, symbolically in Python. So that would be like an advanced uh, Lagrange's topic on uh, the computer. And of course, many other videos and many other topics as well. Be sure to join the Discord server. There's a link in the description to that. And I'll see you next time.